Alrighty, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Ken. I'm here with Ling So, and today Janice Moody is back. Janice is a uh, master gardener and has been a master gardener since 2010. And she's the owner of Seascape Succulent Nursery and Garden Design in Half Moon Bay. Um, Janice did do the talk last month for us. Um, check that out on Ling So's website. And today's talk is going to be all about succulents. So welcome, Janice. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining in. Um, so I've given this talk about five or six times. I hope I <laughs> I've had a little tumultuous morning, so hopefully I can get my head together and focus here. But um, welcome and let's get started. First of all, I wanted to let everybody know who Master Gardeners are. We are trained by University of California uh, as volunteers and certified by the University of California to provide community service and educational outreach that helps home gardeners and community organizations garden sustainably and create a healthy environment. There are numerous ways to contact us, either call our helpline at the number here, and it you can also find this online by just Googling your county master gardeners, the county you're in plus master gardeners, and you'll get the, the helpline number for your county in case you're out of San Mateo County or San Francisco counties. Uh, you can also email us with photos with your problems and we do have some on-site uh, locations as well which I will show you at the end. Uh, the one at Elkis Ranch in Half Moon Bay is now closed because of the flooding and the bridge going out but we do have two other locations you can stop in and ask questions certain days of the week and that will be showed to you at the end of the of the class. So you can also become a master gardener and train as well. It takes about 15 weeks once a week and you can apply at the, on our website. And then I think we accept, uh, I don't know, 30 or so applicants every year or two years. So maybe join in the fun and come join us. Also want to promote our spring garden market, which happens this Saturday at the event center in San Mateo. Uh, we are going to be selling sweet and hot peppers and lots and lots of tomatoes, eggplant herbs, and, and succulents. Um, so just come on by and check us out. We, uh, we really do our best to provide a good variety that will grow either on the coast or inland. Uh, we have a wide variety of starts for you. So that happens 9 to 1 this Saturday at the Event Center in San Mateo. Let's get started. So our learning goals today are, I'm going to introduce you to succulents and the definition of them. I'm going to talk about pre-planting considerations so you, you know what to do with the soil and, and how to amend it or, and that sort of thing before you put your plants in the ground. I'm going to talk about uh, landscape design concepts so you can design your own garden. Then I'm going to talk about care and maintenance tips as well. And then um, there is a succulent propagation YouTube video, and I usually run out of time to show that video, but um, you're welcome to just go to YouTube, Google Janice Moody succulents, and you'll find a 13 minute video on propagation of succulents, as well as all the webinars I've done on gophers and succulents. You'll see all that come up too, I'm sure. Here we go. Um, I won't be discussing container gardening or house plants or art projects or cactus, because we're not in an area that uh, really lends itself to cactus for one thing. Um, and I don't have time to cover all the other ones. I do have a presentation on container gardening though that I can do if there's a lot of interest, uh, we can do that at a later date. So what is a succulent? It's a drought resistant plant that stores water in its leaves, stems, or roots. And for instance, a cactus stores a lot of water in its stem, very little in its leaves, which are the little prickly things on the cactus. Uh, aloes store a lot in their leaves, as you see here with this spiral aloe. I lost my, let me get that back again, laser pointer. So here's the spiral aloe that's storing a lot of water in its leaves. That's a really cool plant. Uh, Echeverias and aeoniums, they store water in their leaves and stems. And then um, agaves store water in their leaf stems and roots, as well as aloes. So aloes have a lot of water storage in their roots, as well as their, as their leaves and stems. 
And then there's elephant foot, foot um, palm right here that has all the water storage in the bulb or the, the root of the plant. So there's different ways of storing water for all these plants, but basically they store water above ground versus below ground seeking out water. The pros, so what are the pros and cons of using succulents in the landscape? Well, there's, I think, more pros and cons. They're very drought resistant, along with many other choices, like California natives are also drought resistant, but succulents are drought resistant because of their water storage capability, whereas California natives are drought resistant because they usually have very deep root systems and can tap into the deeper water. So that's, and by what I mean by drought resistant is that they only need water maybe once or twice a month in the Bay Area. The, another pro, pro is they offer year-round color and interest because their foliage offers a lot of color as in this at, at your very afterglow. It's, it's colorful year-round. You don't need to wait for the flower, although the flower is pretty on these plants as well. Um, they also offer different shapes and textures that really draw your eye. They're relatively gopher and deer resistant, and I say relatively, although they're, as I said before, the aloes and agaves tend to have kind of ropey roots, juicy roots, and the, and the uh, agaves have a core, a center core that is so juicy, gophers will actually go up the core of the agave and kill the whole plant, even a large agave. So those are the ones that are most susceptible to gophers, the agaves, and maybe a couple others that where their stems lay on the ground and they kind of come up and nibble on the stems that are on the ground. I'll talk about that when I come to it. Um, they're also usually very easy to transplant because they're shallow root systems. You don't have to dig up a big root ball at all to transplant them. They're easy to propagate from stems and leaves. Um, uh, it takes longer by leaf cutting, but uh, very easy to propagate most of them by stems. They're easy, or you can actually divide them too. Take off pups and divide the plants or the clumps, and that's another way of propagating them. They're easier to maintain than other drought-tolerant plants. I find myself spending far less time maintaining succulent gardens than I do other perennial gardens that I have, have designed and take care of every so often. The cons, as you probably realized from this past winter, they're um, very sensitive to freezing temperatures or hail, and we've had quite a bit this past winter, unfortunately. So a lot of my plants right now are showing little pings like this plant, this calendrinia down here, all the little pinging going on in the leaves. That was from hail damage. The good thing is it soon outgrows it. In a couple of months, you probably won't even see it because we've got new growth coming all the time and the old leaves die off underneath. Um, many are sensitive to extreme heat. So some that we can grow here on the coast and in San Francisco and San Mateo County are more difficult to grow inland in the valley where it's very hot. Aeoniums is one of those, for instance. It's a little harder to grow in hot uh, temperatures. They do break easily. So dogs and children can get in there and mess things up for you. Uh, so that's why I'll be talking about, you know, keeping their gardens small and reachable. They're very dangerous if they, if they are spiky. That's another consideration, especially the agaves and cactus. And they can rot if left too moist for too long. And this is probably the biggest problem we've had this winter with our atmospheric rivers and so forth. And so um, the, the ones that suffered the most are the summer growers, which are the agaves, the cactus, the echeverias, yeah, and euphorbias, I think I, did I say that again? Yeah, so the, those that grow in the summertime are dormant right now. And so they're more likely to rot during the winter months, very wet winters. So um, I did say that most are deer resistant, but there's always that deer that's extremely hungry and desperate. And I did encounter this once. Now, normally people tell me this agave blue flame right here on the upper left, their deer don't bother it because it's 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 a very tough uh, fibrous leaf, but this is what happened in one garden in Prisma Canyon. So if they're thirsty enough or hungry enough, they'll attack it. And even this really pointy uh, agave americana variegata, this one got eaten on the ends as well. Although maybe that could have been a rabbit because it's down low. But just so you know, they're not totally resistant 
but pretty pretty good resistance there for most part. So pre-planting considerations. We want to try to mimic natural environment. Wherever those plants originated from, that's the kind of environment we want to try to mimic in our own gardens if possible. Mm. Um, we want to do, um, we want to also make sure they have the adequate amount of sun and most of them need four to six hours. We want to provide the right climate if possible. Ideal temperature is 60 to 80. Um, but they can grow in lower temperatures as well as higher temperatures, depending on the variety. Uh, we want to check out your soil, make sure it's not really heavy, heavy clay. And if it is, how to deal with that. We want to look at the drainage on your property and make sure that you, know, you don't have a downspout next to your garden because that could destroy things for sure. Um, so there are different ways of dealing with drainage. And then we want to look at the garden size as well to make sure it's not too big so that you don't walk through the garden and break things as you travel through it. So here are some plants living in their native environment. On the left, is, these are spiral aloes on grassy, grassy mountain slopes of South Africa. And these slopes often get covered by snow. So they're very cold tolerant, yet they don't like it over 85 degrees. So they do great here on the coast, and I usually try to keep some in stock because people love them. But um, just keep in mind that, you know, this particular one doesn't like anything over 85 for any length of time. This one, Dudleya, along the California coastal bluffs, is, tends to grow in, in rock crevices and, and um, therefore likes a lot of drainage and, and warmth surrounded by the rocks. Uh, these agaves I found in Sedona, Arizona, and they're surviving just fine in this very iron-rich soil, as you can see from the color of the soil here and the heat, although they would look better if they were watered a little bit. So all plants need some sun, either indirect or direct. And in most cases, it's direct sun, four to six hours minimum. Um, this, is, this is what helps photosynthesis take place where the light in combination with the carbon dioxide from the air produces carbohydrates, leaf growth, and in, well, in combination with the water as well. And so it gives off oxygen, takes in carbon dioxide, gives off oxygen, and then promotes growth. That's what photosynthesis is all about. So you do, if you put a, a plant in a closet and shut the door, it will die, definitely die on you. Also, you want to take into consideration the sun during different times of year. Uh, we, we've got our sun is very high in the summer months, way up here. And so the shadow on the north side of the building is relatively small. But in the winter, the sun is way behind the building. So therefore, the shadow extends further out. So your winter growers, keep that in mind when you plant winter growing succulents that take, take into consideration where is the sun during that particular time of year? So as I said before, the minimum is four to six hours of sun for growth for most succulents, although there are some that can handle indirect light. They're not the prettiest little plants there are, but, but they're, they will grow in with less direct light. Um, there is indirect or morning sun is best in hot climates, uh, variegated yellow leaves, of the aeoniums, for instance, they prefer less sun or they could get scorched and get sunburned. So just keep in mind that if you choose a very bright yellow, yellow plant, it could easily get sunburned if you're, if you're in a hot climate. On the coast, we're fine here with, with yellow plants in the full sun. It doesn't bother them here on, on the coast. And even over the hill in on the San Mateo Peninsula, they seem to be fine. Um, more sun usually improves colors. And this, this little Echeveria elegans here, or Mexican snowball, is turning pink from the sun. And actually, the cold will turn it pink as well. But look at this plant, same plant. This is an elegans on the right. And this one was growing underneath a big plant. And see it reaching for the sun here. It's, it's stem regions are elongating because it needs to save energy and try to get its leaves out into the sun. So when you see a plant like this with elongated stem regions, that is a plant just seeking sunlight. 
And here's what I was talking about in terms of sunburn. Now, this didn't happen here in Half Moon Bay, but the yellow part of this kiwi aeonium, it turned brown from sun, sunburn. And this very yellow um, sunburst aeonium started um, brown tipping as well from, from excess sun, but not on here on the coast again, just sometimes inland or further south in San Jose, you've got some issues, you know, in the valley, you've got some issues with this. Now, these are the um, more shade tolerant ones. And I usually choose aeoniums here in the center. These are the ones I plant if there's like four, to four hours or up to four hours of sun. Usually I choose the grouping in the middle of these aeoniums. Echeveria conte, it grows in full sun here in Half Moon Bay and loves it. But elsewhere, you might want to give it part shade. This kiwi, kiwi aeonium is another favorite of mine, low growing. And then this agave attenuata ray of light with the yellow variegation on the sides. This one can handle more shade than most agaves. Most agaves need six to eight hours of sun a day, but this one can handle less light. And then there's this portolacaria afra variegata, elephant food, but it's a variegated elephant food. And it, it does well in part shade, but it needs it prefers more warmth than we have here on the coast most of the time. So let's see, we've got some sun and heat loving succulents. Uh, I, I said I wasn't gonna talk about cactus, but I just wanted to show you if I do see some barrel cactus grown around here and I do sell it and it seems to be a popular one. So that is a, a good choice for heat. It actually is very cold tolerant too, as long as it doesn't stay wet too long. If you got cold and wet combination, then cactus are doomed for if it's a prolonged period of time. Euphorbia sticks on fire, now this, grows into trees down in Southern California, but here it barely survives a winter here. I have to bring it in and out of doors all the time to keep it warm. So it's a beautiful plant and striking, but just keep that in mind. You have to provide not only sun, but warmth year round for that one. And the Sapuntia um, is, is a, from the cactus family and, and it's very cold hardy as well, but does again, cold and wet doesn't doesn't do it. Here's a variety of agaves over here that just love heat and sun for the most part. And here's the Portolacara afra, the green leaf variety can handle more sun because it's green leaf versus the yellow leaf one that I just showed you previously. So why is that not working? Here we go. No, my, um, something is, a miss. miss. There we go. Climate and temperature. So as I said, most succulents prefer moderate temperatures between 60 and 80. Very few grow in desert or freezing conditions. And some people are under, under the conception, oh, these are desert plants. They don't need any water. That's not the case. Maybe agaves and cactus. Yeah, you can get those started here, get them established, and then you probably won't need to water them again in our counties. But they'll look a little better if you give them once or twice a month watering. Um, but it's it's um, a misconception that they come from desert regions. Most of them don't come from desert regions. They come from you know the Mediterranean area, Canary Islands, South Africa, so other moderate temperature areas is where they're usually from. And um, yeah, this is the hail damage again, a little bit up close. And this is frost damage here on an agave on the left. So what can you do to protect these? Well, I did a little talk recently for the Garden Club on how to protect your succulents from winter damage. And so this is one of the one of the things I suggested was taking light row cover and cover your sensitive ones. They're here I'm covering an agave tenuata because that's the canary in the cage when it comes to determining if you've had a frost. When you see the tips of your agave tenuata is drooping, then you you know you had a frost that night or that morning. Uh, here's the attenuata over here, and here's it covered up over here. Now, so there are some cold hardy succulents that do pretty well. Um, I was going to update this slide because it's not exactly accurate, but Semper Vivums on the lower, lower right over here, they will grow under snow in Colorado and just about anywhere they seem to survive these little Semper vivums or hen and chicks is what they're usually commonly called. 
And sedum rupestre, lemon ball, or angelina, those can survive quite a bit of cold and, and get through the winter. Even this spiral aloe, the, the um, aloe polyphyla, as I said before, that can be covered with snow and survive. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to update that slide next time because I have some more to share with you as well. Heat, I already showed you this one, but this, this one is, is not just about sun, it's also about heat. So it's basically the same sl slide I just previously showed you. And some other heat tolerant favorites. Um, this pink ice plant or Oscularia deltoides, it gets massively big in the landscape, like four feet in landscape and covered with these beautiful pink flowers. And it's a summer grower. This is one of the few summer growers. And so um, this one could suffer from a wet winter, although mine survived fine out here in Half Moon Bay this winter. This Crassula aborescens silver dollar jade did fine here, has been doing fine even with this cold winter. And many aloes can handle heat, but not necessarily full sun. So just keep that in mind. I know in Sacramento, they tend to hide their aloes under shrubs and things like that because they can handle heat, but not excessive sunlight. Now, these are both heat and cold tolerant agaves. Um, in the stiffer the leaf, the more cold tolerant they are. So this agave blue glow over here on the upper right can go down to minus 20 and not get frostbitten. Whereas this one below it, the Perii retro choke. No, that's no, excuse me. That's a tough one as well. Um, I don't have any more, more delicate ones I'm showing you here. All these are pretty, pretty tough to heat and cold both. Now this succulent dormancy chart, um, it's, it's so much easier to remember the summer growers because the list is so much shorter for those that are grown in the landscape. The list gets longer if you're talking about grown in pots or indoors. But um, I just re remember that summer growers are agaves, echeverias, euphorbias, that oscularia deltoides, and there's a petalanthus that you don't see around here very often, and then the semper vivum. If you can just remember the, like those six, then everything else is basically a winter grower, and the list is much longer on this side. So these are the, the, the um, winter growers over here, and this is the summer growers I have on the, under the here. This is important because of this past winter we had. As I said before, the summer growers, these suffered from rot, uh, from excess rains, whereas these just seem to just be resilient and do fine, especially all my aeoniums. Unless I had a frost, um, these aeoniums and all these other ones survived really nicely. The Dudleya didn't didn't like the ex excessive rain, though. They're used to, you know, as I said, being in rocky crevices on hillsides. And so the Dudleyas tended to rot a little bit this, this year. Soil. So let's talk about soil. The key to your gardening success. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, to reduce climate change and improve soil health, we need to reduce carbon emissions those greenhouse gases and retain more carbon in the earth. And the blacker the soil, the higher the carbon content and the richer in nutrients that soil is. So you the, ideally you wanna keep your, your soil covered with plants or dead organic material because that's what nature intended. If you go out into the forest, you don't see a, people blowing leaves in the forest to get rid of the leaves, right? The leaves just fall and they enrich the soil and they feed those microbes. and that's what helps sequester the carbon in the soil. So um, our, our mantra, our, our um, master gardener mantra is leave your leaves. If you need, if you really have to blow, just blow them off your pathways onto your landscape. Um, don't make it really thick and succulent landscape because that could retain too much moisture. But if, you, if you've got other drought tolerant perennials, they will love having those leaves around them as well as mulch. And bare soil is just dirt. It, we don't call it really soil. It's basically dirt because it's not con, doesn't contain all the nutrients and life it needs to sustain uh, plants in a healthy manner. Avoid tilling as much as possible because that disturbs all the little microbes in the soil. 
And those microbes actually feed your plant what they need when they call for it in a sustainable manner. So those microbes are critical to the health of plants. And then the microbes bring in the nematodes and the worms and help your soil become much more porous. So if you feed your soil, you're not only feeding your plants, but you're also improving the drainage of that soil. Even if it's just a small little layer of mulch or compost, not really thick, but just twice a year, put a little layer on there, it'll improve the soil health and thus the plant health as well. There is a great documentary called Kiss the Ground. It's all about this um, carbon cycle and soil sequestration. I recommend it. We even have a local rancher up here that takes part in that documentary. So do look it up. I think you can watch it on Netflix or something. And as I was describing that carbon cycle, it's also referred to kind of as the soil food web, living soil. Um, and I just want to emphasize that microbes are critical to all life on Earth, and there's far more beneficial microbes than pathogenic ones in this world. So don't be afraid to get your hands dirty because most of those microbes in the soil are really healthy for you, and they've actually been proven to be healthy to humans, even just touching those beneficial microbes. And there's more microbes in one teaspoon of healthy soil than there are people on Earth. So be kind to your microbes and give them what they like to eat. And that would be either roots or dead organic material like leaves or mulch on the surface. So ideal soil is like 50% pore space, which water can occupy, but you don't want it to be saturated with water. You want there to be some air space in there as well, because without air, plants will not survive. They need... They not only need sun, but they need air, as I stated before, from fo for photosynthesis. They need water and they need nutrients. And they're going to get, there are many nutrients in the soil. It's just accessing them that is, is the hard thing sometimes. So clay will retain water and nutrients as well as humus or, you know, compost. And so if you have the ideal so um, soil composition of 20% clay, 40% silt, 40% sand, then you're in really good shape. If you have 70% sand, it's probably too sandy for most succulents, unless you're dealing with cactus, which really need a lot of drainage. Uh, so you, you kind of want that balance if you can get it. And if you don't, let's say you've got 40% clay and, and uh, less of the other components. Well, you can counteract that by adding compost to the soil that will that will help make up uh, or add porosity to the soil. So there are ways of amending soil to make your soil more ideal. And most soil contains at least 5% decomposed organic matter. And um, sometimes it'll it'll be more than that, but ideally this is what you want. And here's some soil samples that were underneath my parking lot when I moved to this location years ago. One area had a mulched garden, front garden bed, and the other was parking lot. And so this is the same soil. This one has been in the parking lot for years under gravel. And then this one is the same exact soil that has been mulched for many years. And look at the pores and crevices in that soil and all the aggregates. So that's so some people come to me and say, oh, I've got terrible soil. I can't grow anything. But this soil here seems like really crust to me. But once I started amending it, then that shovel can actually get in there and, and take out big chunks of soil easily just because of the aggregates formed from all the worm activity and, and um, insects in the soil. And that's, that comes from feeding those microbes. Now, this is what I call heavy, heavy clay soil. And this is what we have up here in Ocean Colony next to the golf course. I, I tell the people that live up there, I think, I, I say to them, I think they, they took all your topsoil and push it onto the golf course because every house up there has soil like this that I've encountered. And it's moldable clay. I mean, you could, you could make ashtrays out of it. It's so moldable. So if you have this kind of soil, then you need to, to amend it with, you know, one third, fine redwood or wood shavings and one third quality compost or aged horse manure. I tend to use aged horse manure um, or one third um, pumice and 
or coarse sand or some very small lava rock. I really prefer that you, if you, if you do anything, it's probably be either the pumice or the coarse sand. They, I think studies have shown that it's, it's better than the, the lava rock. Okay, so let's talk about drainage for a minute. We wanna choose higher versus lower elevations. Over here, this garden in on Howard Street in Burlingame has a raised bed and it's doing wonderfully. It's one of my best, best gardens yet. And it's twice as big as, as this photo. I, I meant to update the slide, but I didn't get a chance to. But yeah, that garden is a showcase and it is elevated from the sidewalk. And here, over here, I wanted to point out, I planted this area in the background, this strip, but we soon found out that the gutter, the downspout was diverting right down and following along that side strip. So we had to take this tubing, black tubing here and divert, take the water from the downspout and empty it on the driveway in order to keep it off of this planted area. So do look to see where your downspouts are going. And then another way to improve drainage is just to mound it. Uh, here, we just added soil and created a mound. And this happens to be an ocean colony where they have terrible soil. So we brought in some better soil for this and that solved the problem. So everything is thriving in that garden as well. Garden size is important. Are you able to reach all plants easily without stepping on them or damaging them? In the front of my business here, I added a little 18 inch wire fence to protect this area from dogs. As you can see, the Oscularia deltoides overgrew it. So that kind of keeps the dogs off the planted area back here and keeps those, keeps the shrubs, keeps the plant pruned a little bit too from all the walking that the dogs do and people do. Um, over here, this is a raised bed. Um, that is easily accessible from all sides. So I just need to walk around this to reach the center of this garden bed. Another way of reaching, and I think the next slide will show that, uh, is with rocks or stepping stones. Um, in this center garden here, there's, these are little stepping stones that look like footprints that we put around the center so that we can get to all the plants easily without creating any damage. Over here, these little pathways were created, so all the garden beds were accessible. And on the right, um, this woman chose to put in a staircase in the middle of her garden because she's she has a disability and has to carry an oxygen, oxygen tank with her. So this enables her to take her oxygen tank and walk up and, and maintain her own gardens on her own. Also, boulders are great because you can put Three boulders create a mound, and then you've got a, a stepping stone. You can just, you know, stretch your leg out, put it on that boulder, and do all your work in that area. So, do we have any questions so far, BB, before we go on? Yes. So, we've got a couple questions here. So, um, it, all the way in the beginning, uh, Janice, I think you might have repeated this succulent, but it was like a swirling succulent. Um, like the first picture, uh, folks are wondering what the name of that particular variety was. The spiral aloe, I think they're referring to. And it's also the, the uh, botanical name is aloe polyphyla or common name spiral aloe. Okay. And, that, and yeah, and that's the one that, that doesn't like excessive heat, but can handle cold weather. So it does great here on the coast. And then a uh, follow-up question is, how do you differentiate between an aloe vera and other aloe varieties? Aloe vera is a certain variety that has a distinctive um, shape to it that's more upright and clumps and it tends to clump as it grows. There's lots of other aloes and most, most of them do tend to clump, but they all are different in appearances. Like a, a spiral aloe is way different in appearance than a uh, aloe vera. Aloe vera is the medicinal one that they use for, you know, putting on skin wounds and things like that. Um, but all aloes have that gelatinous substance in their leaves and they and potentially could be medicinal. I don't know. But the one that's sold for medicinal purposes is an aloe vera and it has more of an upright habit. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so this question is regarding compost. Um, you had mentioned a, a small layer of compost. Uh, how many inches or is there like a ratio of compost that you would apply to um, the succulent yeah. garden? Yeah, I'm going to discuss that in the next slides. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. And then how do you amend sandy soil? Um, with compost, because that's that's about the only thing you can do is um is add more compost to it and that will retain more moisture because sandy soil leaches the nutrients and water way too fast. So adding more compost to it on an annual basis will improve will improve sandy soil as well. Okay, and one last question is, how can we protect agaves from gophers um, besides pots and gopher wire? Um, I am going to discuss, no, I'm not discussing protection from gophers. That's another lecture. Um, but the only, when I tell people, the ones that I would protect would be your, your expensive agaves or the ones that take a long time to get, to get large. Uh, because the gophers will go after that center core of the agave because it's so juicy. So I would cage it and use a large enough cage so that it's big enough for the full mature size of the plant. Don't get a tiny little cage at the bottom. And um, that and, and then a pot, of course. But that those are the only two ways you can protect an agave. Or you can, you know, take my gopher abatement class and learn how to trap them and then you won't have gophers. But basically, those are the only ones that I would would bother protecting because if you look at the roots of most succulents, they're hardly visible. Even a root bound uh, aeonium or uh, any, most succulents, when you look at the roots, you can hardly see them. So gophers are not attracted to them in general, that they love the stems. If the stems are lying on the ground, they'll come up and nibble those stems. Okay, okay. all right. So that's pretty much all the questions we have for this session. Okay, let me get moving then. Um, so let's talk about landscape design. This doesn't happen to be one of my designs, but it's a neighbor's of mine and she did a wonderful job designing it. Um, and I just thought I'd showcase it for you. It's over here on Poplar Street in Half Moon Bay. And she's usually in a lot of the concepts that I'll be discussing, like um, the thriller, filler, spiller kind of concepts and focal points and, and different textures and colors. So she's done it all in this landscape. Uh, so here, the design basics again. We're going to talk about color contrast, shapes and textures, and heights and layers. And this is the one on Howard Street that um, is doing really well with this attenuata agave attenuatas, sunburst aeoniums, oscularia deltoides. This garden is my go-to demo garden. When uh, people want to see one of my gardens, I send them over there to look at 717 Howard Avenue in Burlingame. So when I choose colors, I try to find contrasting colors as much as possible, or, or sometimes I use similar hues, but I, I basically refer to the color wheel a lot, because if you notice, opposite of red is green, and that, those happen to be Christmas colors, and you know what, now you know why they look so good together, right, because they're opposite on the color wheel. So I try to choose opposites on the color wheel whenever I can. Sometimes it's difficult. Uh, when you, especially when you've got orange and blue, so sometimes you have to kind of go with orange and purple, and that still looks really good because it's very close to blue. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I do this a lot um, whenever I'm combining arrangements, for instance, when I create an arrangement or a landscape, I try to put contrasting colors uh, opposite each other and next to each other as well as you know, different shapes and textures. So this color wheel is kind of critical to designing, I think. And also you can create a warm color palette by just choosing the ones on the left side, or you can choose a cool color palette or pastel kind of palette by choosing the colors on the right side. And those look really nice as well. Here's, here's um, a garden designed with a similar hue and cooler colors. This is more pastel here on the left. And this is more cool colors here on the right. And you're gonna be getting the slide deck. So you'll, you'll have all the names of these plants that are labeled underneath here. So don't worry about trying to write everything down. 
Here's my one warm color palette where I've done aeoniums and agave attenuatas. And this is a happens to be a formium, um, an evening glow formium. I do use a lot of formiums in my designs because they add that different texture and height that you can't get from most succulents. And here is the complementary colors I was talking about using the color wheel. The, uh, the purple and yellow look great together. The yellow and the purplish colors of the swart copaonium look wonderful together. And the orange and blue down here of the ice plant and the etcheberry elegans. And then over here, we've got the reds and greens, as well as we threw, I, I did attempt to grow a euphorbia six on fire at once and it's no longer there, of course, it died. <laughs> this is uh, one of the other master gardeners backyards that I work with a lot. She has done a beautiful job in her backyard with contrasting colors and textures and heights. Isn't that gorgeous? And also you can contrast brightness as well. So if you've got something that's really bright yellow, then put it in with a darker color, looks great together. This formium here with the Kiwi Aeonium and the Crassula Campfire, they all look great together. And then varying the shapes and textures. Um, this happens to be the Ruth Bancroft Garden. Look at all the different textures and shapes going on there. That really draws your eye. The focal point, of course, is the agave here in the center, but the background of the tall cactus also kind of draw your eye as a thriller as well. And this is an Echeveri afterglow surrounded by um, Echeveri elegans and the Oscularia deltoides. And here we've got the agave americana with the Oscularia deltoides. And that agave americana right there is now 10 feet wide. So do not buy an agave americana unless you have room for it to grow because it has just about outgrown its space in my backyard. People, I have it labeled Audrey. When people come by now, I just put a label down there, planted in 2016. So it's only seven years old, it's 10 feet wide. And I call her Audrey after Little Shop of Horrors, if you recall that movie. And then here's some colorful companion plants that are not succulents that I use quite a bit. Oh, actually, one of them is a succulent, but the formiums, as I said before, the golden ray, I use that quite a bit, contrasting with the darker, like swart cop aeoniums, for instance. Look at dendrons make a great background as well because they have these colorful tips in the wintertime and they lend, um, a, lend itself to a great background against smaller um, foliage of the of the um, succulents. And here is a Veshinari Yacoides Flamingo Glow. And I'm, I'm getting more and more of those in because they withstand the winter wonderfully. They have this beautiful bloom up here. And it is in the succulent family because it does store its water in its core. So I'm, I love that plant in particular. And the Cordyline Electric Pinks, I use quite a bit too because they don't get as massive as the Formiums. And they, they do better in pots. So the cordyline, most of the cordylines do better in pots than the formiums because formiums get so large. Here's another Leucodendron Safari Gold Strike. And this is the black adder that I use quite a bit in the landscape. Here we go. We're going to vary heights and, and layer. And this is called the Thriller Filler Spiller approach or, uh, <laughs> to, to garden design. And I did not coin that phrase. I, I stole it from whoever coined, whoever originated it. But you want something that draws your eye a thriller or a tall, tall one. And then you want something surrounding that thriller. Those are called fillers. And then the lower line ones or spillers or ground cover. And when you're talking pots, you know, the spiller will spill over a pot, but in the landscape, the spillers are more of a ground cover and, and are low to the ground. So this, this garden is layered uphill with the taller plants be, behind it so that you can see everything visually. You don't want to hide your plants necessarily and tuck a little, uh, you know, a, a beautiful echeveria in amongst all those aeoniums and lose it because then why plant it if you can't see it, right? 
Here's some other thrillers for the garden. This, uh, this art sculpture, cactus sculpture, it can be considered a thriller. This agave Americana over here is one. There's, here's another agave attenuata. This is a Hercules aloe tree, which can get very big. Um, and over here, we've got a pot in the middle of this round succulent garden. It has a pathway all the way around it. So this center pot here it serves as the thriller. And fillers, a lot of times I use aeoniums as fillers, the shorter ones, not the real tall cyclops ones, but the shorter ones. And I use boulders too. I mean, a boulder is a great filler and you don't have to water it. You can lean on it to do your weeding around the plants. Uh, boulders are great. Um, see anything else in here? Yeah, there's this is a deadly of Bretonii. These are at your very afterglows. And this is a um, Kalanchoe Pamilla silver dust plant right here. This one held up really well this winter. I'm really i um, happy with that plant. That's one of the ones I recommend quite a bit. Spillers, in other words, ground covers. So the ones that lay low to the ground and pop at you so you they don't blend in with the soil necessarily. You know, the sempervivums, the hen and chicks are very low lying, but most of them are not very colorful. So if you plant hen and chicks as a border plant, you tend to lose them in the in the landscape. They get confused with the soil a lot of times. So I don't use them routinely in landscapes, but I do use this uh, Crassula campfire quite a bit. It suffers a little bit in the winter time, looks a little bit, you know, black, it gets black spotted, but then it recovers this time of year. Um, is Sedum repressor uh, Angelina, that happens to be, oh, this is Angelina over here. Um, and this Crassula Red Pagoda looks great um, other than wintertime. In wintertime, it looks kind of sad. Sedum um, rubitictum jelly bean. That's a cute one. It doesn't always look good after winter, but it's a cute and colorful one. And it has a red, which is hard to find in succulents. A lot of times it's that red color. And here's that Calicoi Pamela I told you about that withstands, uh, holds up really well through the winter. Also try to choose things that pop in the garden and they're usually brightly colored or different textured. So they draw the eye. And so this sedum repressed lemon ball, I use quite a bit as a ground cover. There's another one. Um, I don't know if I have it listed, but it is a confusum. Sedum confusum also is really cold tolerant and, um, and withstands winter pretty well. This is the red pagoda again. This is the campfire, red, the Acrasola campfire. Here's the afterglow again. This the Aeonium sunburst always pops really well as well. And then for large spaces, if you're looking to fill a big space with very few plants, then these are the plants you want to choose. Um, this one in the back here, you can barely see it is an Aeonium cyclops. It gets four feet tall. Uh, this one here in the middle, the agave americana, can get 10 feet tall, so be wary of that. These jade plants, of course, they can get big, you know, five or six feet sometimes. Um, this, uh, oh, that's calendrinia. Yeah, here's calendrinia right here. So calendrinia spectabilis, a rock purslane, one little plant will produce five feet of space for you, a, a planting. And it blooms almost all year long here on the coast. I do cut it back this time of year. The, the stems kind of look a little bit dried out after a winter. So I do cut the flowers off. And when the stems look a little bit leggy and not as full of foliage, then I'll cut it back to a little ball of stems and let it regrow. So it may look ugly for a little while, but this is a very resilient plant. The gophers do like this because the stems tend to lay on the top of the ground. So just be wary of that. And then this one, this torch aloe gets really massive, kind of builds upon itself. But aren't those, um, the flowers just beautiful and it attracts hummingbirds. Most aloe plants will attract hummingbirds. So those are, those are great ones to plant in your garden. So I have a demonstration garden behind my place. You're welcome to come by and take a look. 
this these are much bigger now um, than this is taken probably last last spring. But here's that agave I told you about. Now it's even bigger than this. <laughs> that blue, that uh, agave americana in the background. That is a huge plant. And in front of that is the cyclops aeonium. Gets about four feet tall. It makes a really nice centerpiece and backdrop for a succulent garden. Here's that. Here's my famous spiral aloe, and then the agave blue flame and agave blue glow. These two started rotting this this winter because all my water drains from the patio onto that space. So the only ones suffering throughout the, all these rains we had were these two agaves. And my front garden is a rock wall and it's raised up a little bit and these did not suffer at all from the rains. And this is a part of the demonstration garden as well. You can come back and take a peek at this. These are a lot of aeonium surrounding, surrounding an agave attenuata ray of light. And in the very front, I've got a Kara stripe agave attenuata with some blue glows on each side and some echeverias. Right now, the echeverias are not looking that good after winter. Here's some of my favorites. I just mentioned the agave blue flame and the agave um, blue glow. This one withstands extremes in temperature really well. This one gets pinged a little bit from hail, but it recovers. And what I like about it is there's only one little tip that's slightly pointed, but it's flexible tip. So this one is not going to like pop a basketball in your garden. This one, on the other hand, is very, very spiky. And people have told me their basketballs have popped when they hit this agave. So just be leery of that. This is the uh, Calendrinia spectabilis or the rock purslane on the right. And then these are Formium here. And I think I've mentioned all these others before. Some, the Aeoniums, the Echeveria afterglow, the red pagoda, and the spiral aloe. Here's the Calendrinia again in large container. Uh, I don't think I need, and here's, here and for some reason, this these two were planted at the same time, and this one on the left just died. Now the, I don't know why one will die right next to another, but it does happen, and it often happens with Oscularia deltoides, the pink ice plant. I planted uh, four in my garden in front, and one just died for no reason. The gopher gopher didn't get it, so I don't know what what happened there. It's beyond me. <laughs> And then here's the spiral aloe again. And the agave favorites. Uh, this, this one is a cool one, a Queen Victoria. It's very slow growing. The spikier and the stiffer the leaf, the slower the grower. So this um, agave Queen Victoria, very slow growing, as well as this blue glow. This agave blue flame grows twice as fast, which is a good part, the reason I recommend it a lot gets about four to five feet. This one only gets about two to two feet or two to three feet. And then this agave quadricolor here is only, it stays small, but it's very slow growing as well. And it gets to be about 18 inches or two feet. Here again are my um, Echeveria favorites, the afterglow on the left, the Conte here on in the middle. This one is a little bit hard to find. I do have some now, but they're, they're usually kind of hard to find. And then the Echeveri Elegans I use a lot in borders because it hen and chicks out and creates uh, more and more. Every year it gets a little wider. And this is a blue curls, Echeveri blue curls, which is also a pretty cool plant. Or they, I hear it says Lady Aquarius, but they're very similar. Blue curls and Lady Aquarius are almost the same. Again, my favorite aeoniums, this is the sunburst aeonium. Again, sunburst in the middle. Down here is a Mardi Gras, the reddish one. This one's a little bit tough to find, but I, whenever I find it, I buy lots of it. So um, that's called Mardi Gras. This one above, it is called Swart Cop, or Black Rose, people refer to it as Black Rose. And then this is a Kiwi aeonium, stays smaller. It gets shrubbier, but it's very nice as a filler. And again, the uh, Kalinkoe Pamela, the flower dust plant is a great ground cover is, oh, and here's the one I was telling you about that's very cold hardy, Sedum Confusum. It has a bright yellow flower when it blooms. 
and it withstands winter really well. And then the Oscularia deltoides with the pink, the pink ice plant. Again, I'm repeating myself, I know, but you, you're familiar with all these other ones, this snowball, the Angelinas, no, sedum snowball here, or lemon ball, I'm getting tired, excuse me. And then the Crassula campfire. Here's some great pollinators for your garden. Um, bees love the Calendrinia spectabilis, the rock purslane. They love most aloes blooms and they love the sedum autumn joy. And, this, and the aeoniums, oh my gosh, when the aeoniums bloom, they're just gorgeous, especially the swart cop. It's a dark colored leaf, it's this bright yellow uh, um, bloom and the bees just love it. And so the, the darker the leaf, the more yellow the, the bloom, it seems like. So they're not all that yellow, but when they do bloom, they're beautiful. Now keep in mind that that bloom, when it dies, dies down, that whole stem will die. So you cut it off at a branching point or at the ground, but you always get new growth from below. So don't worry about as long as you've got good soil and you take care of your plants appropriately, then the aeoniums will keep pupping from below and you'll have more growth. Okay, so any other questions thus far? Uh, just a couple here. Um, how do you propagate hens and chicks? Um, there's a whole video on that. I don't think we're gonna have time to show it at the end, but. I'm going to give you the link in this slide deck and it's 13 minutes long and it tells you how to propagate from, from leaves and stems and pups or offsets they are called offsets, but you just basically dry out the, the part that's, that's um, been broken, dry it out for a few days and set it in some light soil and give it part sun and you've got a new plant. But there, there's some techniques you can watch from my video if you like as well. Alrighty. Uh, do you have any thoughts on fan aloe? Yeah, they're a wonderful plant. They're, that is an unusual um, text. I mean, not texture. Yeah, shape. They, they have an unusual fan fan shape like this that overlap each other, and they can get fairly large. And the blooms are gorgeous. Yeah, I love I love fan aloes. In fact, I even have some of those in stock because I came across them recently in the nursery. What that would that be used as like one of the thrillers or like a centerpiece? Perhaps? Yeah, yeah, it would be because they get pretty large. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, one more question. Um, is it okay to have succulent bed next to the grass where the sprinklers go off? As long as those sprinklers don't water your plants three times a week, like a lot of people have their lawns set on timers that go off three times a week, which I still think it's too much for the Bay Area. I think most people can get by with twice a week. But regardless, you don't want to water succulents three times a week. You want to ideally water your plants maybe every two weeks. And in some cases, maybe once a week if you're over the hill in a warmer, like Rivet City, maybe, maybe once a week. But that's about all. And you want to water to a depth of six inches, which I'm going to get into in the next section. I'll, I'll discuss that further. All righty. Okay, that it? That's it. Okay, let's move on. So here we go, watering, soil amendments, and plant care and pests. Um, let's get started. So watering, uh, I tend to use these, um, these uh, water breaker valves, these water breakers that are up, pictured up here. And I think it's a, called a DRAM 400. And it puts out a lot of water. So don't be afraid to water your plants well and deeply. And it, it, it actually helps get rid of some aphids sometimes. And, and you want to water everything well to a depth of it, at least six inches. And then you want to take your moisture meter and, and just make sure everything's wet at six inches and then wait until it's like approaching dryness, right between dry and moist. That's the ideal time to water it well again. So if you keep it wet, you're risking rotting the plant and you're also wasting water. Um, so that's the key to succulents is don't keep them wet if you can help it. Water when they're dry to your finger depth or dry at six inches and water well. Let them drain. Make drainage is really important. Don't put it in a pot that has no hole. That's, a, that's destined to die. 
Um, and then mornings are best to water usually, and drip irrigation is the most efficient way to do it. And here's a Netafim system here. There's other drip systems, but this one has the emitters built into the half inch tubing versus those little tiny quarter inch spaghetti tubes that come off of half inch tubing. I find those to be least efficient and it, it doesn't tend to water the whole zone. It only waters maybe half the plant. And, and so, I, and they break easily. I mean, they're always breaking with hose and weeding and that sort of thing. And if you've got a break in one of those, then most of your garden will go without water because of the leak. So I do recommend the half inch tubing with the emitters built in and they, you can get the uh, increments, I think six inches or 12 inches or 18 inches, but I usually recommend like six, six inch distances between the emitters with over staggering them. Like if you have, if you have one line behind a plant, then the next line goes in front of the plant and you stagger the emitters so they don't come out at the same point. That's, that's the best way to do it. And these rain barrels are great. And there's usually some rebates offered through Bosca. So if you just Google or go to Bosca's website, um, there's usually a rebate available. I got I paid probably half of these two, two, tank, two barrels paid for with a rebate. And rainwater, and by the way, you know when we get the first rains in the winter, your, your succulents or all plants just come alive, even though they've been watered by hand and you think they've been watered enough, but boy, rainwater, they just love it because it's 100% soft water. There's no minerals in it. It's slightly acidic, which most plants prefer, and it pulls nitrates and oxygen from the air, which I didn't realize before. So this is kind of new information for me, but it actually pulls the nitrates and oxygen from the air. So it's like the best water you can give your plants. So when we, uh, in, in the winter, we, we use this, the rainwater all the time and the fog. Oh my gosh. In Half Moon Bay, we collect a lot of water just from fog. So it's really beneficial if you live in a foggy area, especially. Now, what are signs of underwatering? Shriveled leaves is a definite sign. Air, um, aerial roots is another sign. Like these roots are trying to seek out more water. So when you see a lot of aerial roots, you can probably assume that your plant is underwatered. These again are shriveled leaves here, dead leaves here. Now this is a normal process, having dead leaves under leaves under your you know viable leaves. Um, so sometimes people might think, oh, I've got a lot of dead leaves on my aeoniums. But in the summertime, keep in mind, aeoniums are, are dormant in the summer and they create a lot of dead foliage underneath their leaves. And all you need to do if you don't like the looks is pull it off and just throw it in, throw it underneath the plant, which then the microbes will have some more organic material to eat. So, um, so yeah, so dead foliage is not necessarily uh, dried up from lack of water. It's just a normal process, growth process. Now this aeonium over here, you can see that at the, at the upper area, upper tip here, it's narrower and that is a time period in its life when it received less water. So the stem got narrower. So that's another indication of uh, underwatering. Now overwatering, this is what can happen when you overwater your aeoniums in the summer dormant period. Um, the stem just will, will rot and bend over like this. Uh, agaves are harder to determine if they're if they're overwatered and rotting, but usually a telltale sign is a black, a black leaf that usually tells you, or they start to get mushy or white in color. Sometimes they'll be white. I, I have a new picture I'm going to be taking of what they look like now, which is even different than this. So they can be white, but they usually tend to get mushy or black. And leaf rot in uh, a kiwi aeonium, that's what that looks like. And then these elegans are a great little sturdy plant, but occasionally they tend to get a little bit rotted around the edges here. And then this is an agave root rot, which is very brown and dead looking. It just might be hard to see here, but it's black and black looking roots. And they've kind of just gone away. Basically, you, you lift the plant out of the ground and there's no roots left. Here's Kalanchoe stem rot right here. 
So those are all indications of overwatering. Now, fertilization or amending soil. Um, organic is always preferred versus synthetic fertilizer because synthetic fertilizer uses a lot of um, comb combustion engines to create. I mean, it's it's not it's very it's not sustainable at all using synthetic fertilizer. So ideally, you want to use organic. And most of the time, I don't have to throw on fertilizers on my plants in, in the landscape because there's tons of nutrients in the soil. The microbes just need to find it and feed the plant it what it needs when it when the plant calls for it. They exchange nutrients. The microbes and the plants exchange nutrients. So there's lots of nutrients in the earth. And you just need to help the microbes provide those nutrients to the plant. Uh, so that what I use, and I'm going to discuss it in the next slide, is, is aged horse manure with shavings. But you can use amendment mix, any type of amendment mix. Linkso cells a great amendment mix that um, you can use as a top dressing. I, you can add it twice a year to the top layer, just only about an inch. You don't need much more than that in the fall when the white rains begin, and then maybe again in the spring when the burst of growth occurs. Um, so synthetic is, feeds the plants directly and usually only contains nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, whereas whole organic fertilizers also contain those trace minerals and micronutrients, and those really make your plants thrive. I mean, if you just gave it synthetic fertilizer only, they would survive, but they're not going to thrive as much as if you give them a complete uh, whole plate full of everything they need in terms of mineral, trace minerals, and micronutrients. Just because a plant grows doesn't necessarily mean it's healthy. Just keep that in mind, you know. I liken it to um, feeding, feeding kids uh, fast food all the time, right? Just because they're growing, and usually it's horizontal growth, not so much, you know, vertical growth, that doesn't mean they're healthy, right? But, you know, <laughs> just keep that in mind. Um, so as again, we, we might, we, uh, Master Gardener's mantra is feed your soil, not your plants. And here's what I do. I apply half inch to one inch of quality compost or amendment mix or aged. It has to be aged horse manure. Don't put raw horse manure on anything. It's, it could be pathogenic and uh, hot as well and burn your plants. So they, it has to be aged. And I believe Lingso uh, sells a, a horse manure as well from a reliable organic source. So that might be a, a good choice as well besides their amendment mix. And so I apply it twice a year as I stated before. Um, and fish emulsion is great too, but I would say that's best reserved for container gardening because you can get all the nutrients you need in your plants in the landscape just from your microbial activity. But if they happen to be in a container, then um, fish emulsion or compost tea or something called mupu tea is actually made from manure, from cow manure, I think. And it's and it's made in a liquid. You make it, mix it up and in a liquid uh, state and then put it on your container gardens. Uh, Rock says mulch. Now, this comes from uh, Deborah Lee Baldwin's website, but it was designed by Laura Eubanks from San Diego, and I'm sure you, many of you follow her on YouTube. She's a great designer. She does some beautiful gardens down there in Southern California, and she uses Rock says mulch routinely for everything. I don't because, you know, they, they look great initially, and then when you start pulling weeds and replanting things, they get the, the rocks get churned into the soil, and they're not giving those little microbes any food, right? So, and they can also heat up and create too much heat, not necessarily in our area, but, you know, there's, there's some plants that couldn't tolerate the, the heat retention that the rocks can, can retain. So... Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind. I, I don't recommend rocks. Sometimes I've done it for specimen gardens, like if they wanted just specimen agaves in their gardens. And then I said, okay, well, you can do the rocks, but, you know, put down weed fabric under it so you don't have to be pulling weeds out of it all the time. And that's the only time I would ever recommend weed fabric because otherwise it, it also just lifts up all the time and looks terrible in, in the gardens. 
So here's the pros and cons again. So um, the pros of rocks as mulch is better weed suppression than wood with if you put weed cloth underneath it. It's I think it's better for desert specimen plants that don't require many nutrients because agaves and even jade plants and um, cactus, they don't need as many nutrients. They're used to desert conditions. Well, not jade, but jade can live in a pot for years and years. Um, they can add design elements, but I tend to use boulders instead of gravel or rocks. Um, they're fireproof, and that's a plus, especially in this in this environment we have here in California. Uh, your insurance company may prefer that you use this as, instead of any kind of wood product mulch, and then you may get a better rate on your insurance. Um, they can provide a buffer zone from dogs if you put a little border in front of your garden as well. And um, but again, they can possibly overheat roots in hot climates and they don't feed your soil life. Um, they may limit the spreading of tapestry designs because they, especially if you've, there's weed cloth underneath them and your, your plants cannot spread as readily and, and reroot and they churn into the soil again. And then it, it increases soil compaction. It doesn't lend itself to uh, aerated soil because it doesn't, it's not feeding that soil life, as I said before. All right, so the maintenance for um, these plants, as I said, you know, you take an aeonium and these dead leaves along the underside of the aeonium leaves, that's normal growing process. They're always going, you never, it's like your skin on your, your on your body. You know, you exfoliate skin every day. You, you, you don't have the same skin you were born with. <laughs> so this is a natural growth process uh, as well as down here, this agave, this is a natural growth process too. And by the way, when this agave got to be overwhelmingly huge and, and, and encompassed a lot of my neighboring plants, then I get my saws all out and I actually cut, cut off these with a sawzall. They weigh about 30 pounds each now, they're huge, but that's another way of uh, maintaining huge agaves in the landscape with your hacksaw or sawzall. Um, we're gonna talk about other methods as well as we go on, but we're transplanting and dividing and so forth. So the removal of the dead leaves, as I said, the transplanting is really easy because the roots are very shallow, as I said before. And here's a clumping uh, aloe. And all you need to do is pull this apart, try to get some roots when you do it, because then that's half the battle. You already have a plant. You don't have to wait for those roots to regenerate from a cutting. Um, so that's simple. And then dividing or depupping. Uh, agaves tend to pup quite a bit. In fact, that big agave in my backyard is, produces offsets like this constantly. I'm constantly pulling them out. And you got to protect yourself when you do it. Wear those leather gloves that go all the way up to your elbows or you're going to find yourself with little prongs stuck in your skin. Believe me, it's not pleasant. And then deadheading and pruning. Now, this is what I said about after the... Uh, Aeoniums bloom, they look like this. And this is a time when you probably want to cut them off. So you take your loppers or your pruners or your saw mm -hmm. and you just cut it off at the ground level or at a branching point, whatever looks best. Use your eye, determine that. And then um, this calendrinia down here, I will cut off all these, these dead blooms once a year or um, and cut it way back to a little ball of stems sometimes. And then again, the, the expired blooms here, you can prune those off. And then these are just uh, Osculara deltoides. When it gets too massively and encroaches into other areas, you can just cut that off and you've got um, new cuttings to grow from. Nails is the arch nemesis of mine, of me in the garden. We're constantly finding them and it's difficult to control them in pots in the nursery, but it's a little easier in the landscape. Uh, there's lots of, of ways of doing it without using any pest pesticide, but if you have to use a pesticide, Sluggo is organically approved for organic gardens. Um, so you just sprinkle that on at night and then the birds won't go around and eat. Even if the birds eat it, they're not gonna be harmed from the iron phosphate 
that that is the active ingredient in it. So you can use sluggo in the landscape. They like look for them in hiding places, like in the middle of formiums. They tend to hide in those tall grassy um, formiums. Look for them there. Go out at night with a headlamp on. Sometimes this is what I found out. One night it went out and the Senecio was just covered with 20 so snails. It, it was just being eaten alive. And um, if you have a neighbor with chickens, then save the snails for the chickens or, you know, squish them, whatever you want to do. They're not native to this, to the United States or California. So I don't feel guilty squishing them. And then uh, you can put like cardboard out at night too. They'll hide under the cardboard and you just lift up the cardboard and you've got a ton of snails. That's another way of dealing. Bring in ducks or geese. They'll eat your snails up. Not chick Chickens do, do more harm than good. So I would not use chickens even though chickens love them. Um, yeah, those are the, the best ways, ways to deal with snails. Aphids is another issue, although I rarely see it in the landscape, I think because my plants are much healthier and more resilient in the landscape from getting all those extra nutrients from the soil. But uh, when, an ex when a bloom is about to expire, you will see aphids sometimes. And so I usually just cut that bloom off so it avoids spreading to other plants nearby. Um, you can spray them off with water. You can try compost tea. It's anecdotal. There's no firm research yet, but some people say it works really well. Uh, lady beetles, you can you know bring those in if you want. Set, let them out at night so they don't wander elsewhere. Um, yeah, and, and always you can always refer to our UC uh, pest notes by just Googling UC IPM pest notes and the and the um, pests you're talking about. And then you'll you'll bring up these notes and you can read more about them, uh, how to remedy them as well. This one is a uh, little green larva that this year it hasn't been so bad right now. I think it's because all the rain we had, these little cabbage moths, I've seen fewer and fewer of them this year. But when I see them flying around in my garden, I know they're laying eggs. And this is what they're going, we're going to be seeing is these little green caterpillars that go right in the middle of your plant, attack the apical tip. And they cruise, create a lot of webbing. So if you see webbing and leaves stuck together, then pull them apart. You'll probably find that little critter hiding in there. Um, there's there's a spray you can use, Bacillus thuringiensis, or called BT, but we I don't use it. I just pick them off when I see them on on the plants. And again, I don't see them as much in landscape plants as I do potted plants. And here's another uh, a sword cop with that damage. So when you see leaves eaten like this, it, this it doesn't look like snail damage to me because snails take out circular cuts in the in the um, foliage. These are more raw cut, and they, there's a little webbing around it. So I'm that tells me there's this little critter hiding in there somewhere, and I and I seek him out. So this is the propagation video, but I'm not sure we have time for that. But this is the, the link, and you're welcome to watch it later on. It's um, 13 minutes long. And are there any, let's see if there's, uh, Hi what's, there. no, let me, let me so <laughs> I, I, how are we doing for time? Do you have questions next? And is that we about have a couple of questions, and we've got about 40 minutes left. Oh, that long? Oh, okay. Yeah, well, so we're we good. Can... Yeah, so we could actually, we, we could watch that video then if you like. Sure. Do you want to do questions first or the video? Yeah, um, okay. Yeah. okay. Qu questions first. How's that? Okay, just a couple here. Um, I know you talked about the drip line and the irrigation. Uh, could you uh, explain what the problem was with using the quarter inch uh, drip lines um, and the clogging and all that? Yeah, um, well, they do tend to clog, but... Um, but the worst problem with those is that they break easily and then you've got a leak and then the rest of the plants don't get enough water. And so you're constantly trying to, to seek it, find the leak somewhere and replace the tubing. And also those little tiny tubes emit very little water. And you, in landscapers typically only put one tube per plant. And that one little tube that goes to that one plant really doesn't water that root zone enough for it to, to provide 
uh, a healthy plant, you're also watering the microbes as well. You know, you're feeding those microbes water as well. You don't want to soak them and drown them out, of course, but you want to you want to water the zone. You don't want to water half of a plant. That's the problem with those. And I mean, some people, if they insist that they need to keep that system, I say, well, then put two emitters per plant. That will help. And then make sure that, you know, you're very careful when you're weeding and hoeing around it because you could end up breaking those, which they do break very easily. All righty. Uh, one more question here. This is regarding the slugs and the worms. Um, Someone's asking, do slugs hurt worms? I No, I yeah, okay. What else? <laughs> is it bad to use near a creek slash waterway or ocean? Um so what, what 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 is bad to use near uh I'm guessing the one that you the the sluggo. Oh the sluggo. No, sl yeah. sluggo's Sluggo is approved for organic gardening. It's it's supposedly not. It's safe around pets, and it's safe it's safe around animals. So um, you don't want to get the one that that says Sluggo. I don't know what it's called these days. There's one that includes earwigs and and the sow bugs, but you don't want the expansive Sluggo. You just want the basic Sluggo that goes after slugs and snails. Okay, so I guess it, it was a typo, sorry. So the question was, do, does that product hurt worms, like earthworms? Uh, no, not at all, no. Mm -mm. Okay, all righty, we can move on. Okay, so if we go back, then I can play this video if you're, if, if you, people want to do that. Hopefully you can hear it. Let me know if, oops, it didn't play. Let's do this. No, I'm sorry. Last time I hit the key, it actually played, and now it doesn't want to play. Let me um, get my it may cursor. Maybe the pointer there. Yeah, I'm going to change it to my pointer. Okay, I'll undo that one. Okay, there we go. Small businesses are what turn a town into a community. So when it comes to keeping small businesses connected, I'm trying our to network skip the is ads. the backbone they can count on. Yeah, We're Spectrum sorry. Business. Okay, there we go. Hi there. Today I'm going to discuss succulent propagation. Yeah, we, we can't see the video. You, to do Eve, you can't, can't see it. Okay. Partner. It's not in it, bed. Okay. It's so successful. You're going to get a lot of reward um, from it. So I'm going to discuss three methods. Leaf cutting, stem cutting, here. and by pup or offsets. There is a fourth. It actually went to um, the browser instead of the embedded video. Let me try hitting this again. Let me try it you again. You can just uh, share your screen on the video instead of the PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Um, screen PowerPoint slideshow. Okay, let's see if that does it. I don't think that did it either, did it? No. No, I think the green button down there, you can select the, the browser to share. So share screen, and then you can just select that browser there. Let me try this one more time, hitting this and see if I can get this. No, it's not, I'm sorry. Oh boy. Okay, where's my browser? Maybe because I closed my browser, that's probably it. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, I would probably just click on the YouTube link again and just pause yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> All good. We've got time. So you're good. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Okay. And Hi there. Today share. I'm going to discuss and, uh, succulent propagation because it's such an easy thing to do, even for a beginner gardener. Okay. It, it's Can so you it successful, now? you're going to get a lot of reward from it. So I'm going to discuss three How methods. Full screen, Janet. Full screen, by yeah. pup okay. or offsets. There is a fourth method, of course, and that would be by seeds. But a typical home gardener. I'm looking for the full grows. screen, sorry. And it's usually over to the right side where I'm looking at, I'm getting everything. Bottom in. right there. Yeah, I just have to move the strip that I've got here. Okay, now we go. Here we go. 
succulents from seeds, so I'm not going to go into that. That's primarily used for cactus growing or solitary growth habits, such as uh, spiral aloes who don't produce offsets or stems. So let's first talk about seeds. Um, let's first talk about uh, leaf cuttings and how easy that is to accomplish. Uh, num all you need to do is choose a plant with a juicy leaf, such as these sedums. They have a lot of water content. And, or this graptopetalum as well. Lots of water in the leaves. Or this echeveria as well. And how do you know if it's a good candidate for a leaf cutting? Well, if you take the leaf and it's nice and plump and you twist it and it doesn't have any damage, visible damage to the end, then that's more than likely a viable cutting. And the same goes for this graptivaria. You just twist it off, take a look at it. It's a very clean uh, end, so it'll probably more than likely grow roots. The same with same with the sedum, very easy. The next step after you do this is to simply place it on top of some soil and such as this tray right here is where I propagated a lot by leaf cuttings. So all you simply do is lay it on top, moisten it with some water, keep it a, keep it a little moister than it is now and put it in part shade. Don't leave it in hot sun because that will dry up the leaves before they start making roots. So after about three or four weeks, what you're going to get is some root formation. And you may not see the roots because they're going to be in the soil. But if you pull it out of the soil, you'll notice there's quite a few roots that form there. And you'll see a little rosette forming there as well. After a few more weeks, you're going to have a larger rosette such as this. And this leaf, as you can see, is shriveling away and then give it a three or four more weeks later and you've got little rosettes that have formed. So that's an easy way to start a new plant. And what's an advantage of starting plants by leaves? Well, you can get many more plants out of one plant if you use leaves versus stems. For instance, in this case, with this Echeveria, I, mean, I might get 50 plants out of this if I counted all the leaves. But if I use stem cuttings, I'm only gonna get seven or eight because that's how many stems I've got here. How to kill all mosquitoes oh. in the area in 90 seconds. This simple but brilliant trick Darn you can do tonight it. to eliminate all mosquitoes. So it all depends on how many plants you have around and um, what you can afford to use as cuttings. And also keep in mind that when you propagate by seeds, it's gonna take twice as long, maybe three or four times longer to get a good sized plant from a leaf cutting versus a stem cutting. So you have to be patient if you're gonna go use the leaves. And so if you want to speed up the process, then do it by stem cutting. And these as well, these can be stem cut as well instead of using the leaves. Just simply break it off or cut it. You can also cut it with a sharp object. It doesn't really matter how clean the cut is in this case. But you want some viable nodes because the leaves are going to emanate from where the roots are going to emanate from where the leaf nodes were and are. So the more nodes you have, the more likelihood that roots will form. When there's a big distance between the leaf, then um, there, there will be formation of of roots regardless because they used to have you can tell there's little nodes along the, su the side of this stem as well so this is a good one that will form roots easily but be sure before you place this in soil be sure you dry out the the end so it's not no longer green so it's calloused over as in the case of this one that's been sitting here for maybe a few days now it's pretty dry and that's what you want before you put it into soil if you don't it's likely to suck up too much water and rot the plant. It's already full of water in the leaves. You don't want to add too much more water or you can rot the plant. So it's a simple process from here. You make your cuttings and you prepare your soil. And when I prepare soil, I usually make a light mixture and I add pumice, maybe one quarter pumice to three parts of a good quality soil to lighten it up and add air space to it so it doesn't 
get too wet and, and rot the plant, especially in the midwinter if you're trying to do this. It's not a good idea to do it in the midwinter because most of these plants are not growing during that time anyway. The only ones that start growing in the winter are usually the aeoniums like this and the and these these tend to grow in late winter but most of them grow in spring or summer so that's the time when you want to propagate and preferably with no flowers on them but if you do find flowers on the leaves then you just want to make sure you cut them off because you don't want the energy from the for the roots to go to the flower making you want the energy to go to the roots so I've just cut off all the flowers on this, and now I have possibility of quite a few stem cuttings from this calendrinia. <laughs> now, I could also use the main stem if I wanted to, but that's not going to make a very pretty plant. Uh, so I will discard this, and I will just use the smaller ones because they're going to make a nicer looking plant to begin with. So simply remove the leaves, being careful not to damage the stem. If these were leaf cuttings, you want to make sure you don't damage the leaf, but in this case, you don't want to damage the stem because that's where the roots are going to emanate from, these nodes. And you only need a couple of leaves on top, and you need at least one node below. In this case, I've got like three nodes below, so I'm being extra cautious, I guess you'd say. Now I want to make sure that this callus is over on the end before I put it in soil. But once I have my soil prepared, I wet the soil, poke holes in the soil with an object, and simply stick it in, and then tap around it to decrease the airspace around the stem. You don't have to tap heavily, just lightly, just to get rid of the airspace. And then you just wait, and you've got a plant much sooner than you would with a leaf cutting. Um, so let's see, uh, other options when you make leaf cuttings, um, stem cuttings, excuse me. If you have an option between this one or this one, this is your better option for growth. This is a very dried out stem region. It's not gonna have a lot of viability in it. It looks very dry and everything. And then it's also got a flower on the end. So that's definitely something you don't want. If you did have flowers, if it was flowering season, it's simple enough to do this. But I still would not choose this one because it's too dry. So this would be a much more likely candidate. I can make several cuttings from this. Here's two, for example. This is the apical tip end. This is the, this is the cutting that's more than likely going to start roots probably 100% sure, as long as this wasn't real floppy on top. As long as it's holding upright, it has some energy in it, this is the one that's probably going to set roots faster than this mid-cut one. And I usually do pinch off the apical tip just to force energy back down. And then I, instead of twisting these off, which could cause damage to this tender stem, I would cut these off. Again, I wait a few days for this to callus over and then place it in the soil and gently tap around it to reduce the airspace. And this is your next cutting. Do the same thing. So you think you know wigs, uh, but do you really? Oh. First up, we've got. And you've got your second cutting from that same stem. From that same stem. It's as simple as that. And then you want to place these in part sun, just maybe a little morning sun, not intense heat, um, and and within, and maybe water about three times a week, and you'll have a plant in record time compared to the leaf. Now, the other method I want to discuss is um, propagation by offsets or puffs. Now, when we propagate by puffs, there's usually less stem involved. And this, this is an Echeveria elegans, and they happen to have pretty, pretty decent stems attached to them. But in many cases, you won't get this long a stem. And then you would have to be careful about placing it in soil because you don't want soil right next to these leaves, these juicy leaves, because that could potentially rot it. I'll give you another example. Here's another Echeveria. I removed this yesterday, and it's already like calloused over. 
but I would give it another day. As long as the leaves start, don't start getting too floppy, I would, I would uh, let this dry out a little bit longer. It already has a couple of roots forming, by the way. Now to remove the next pup from this one, I would try to cut as close to this mother plant as possible. And then just remove these lower leaves so you have a little bit of stem. You could actually remove more than that if you wanted to, but just be careful not to just not to damage the stem because that's where the roots will emanate from. And then let that dry out and be careful again not to have it overly wet next to the leaves. Now aloe vera aloes are also pup formers. And to separate this, you would want to put on some leather gloves, take it out of the pot, and gently pull it off. And you'll probably have a, a wound when you do that, because this is a very thick stem, and it will resemble this when it's pulled off. Now, this has been callousing over for a few days, and it's probably ready to go into some soil. But again, you want to be careful about getting it on top of too wet a soil for too long, because the leaves are so close to the to the end here. Other good candidates for pups would be the Sempervivums. They pull off easily and are, this is a hen and chick Sempervivum. And that's a simple process to do that. And I would, again, you would wanna wait a day or two before you put them in soil. And so um, the other thing I just wanted to mention was that when you water, you know, these you would water a little bit more frequently than you would an established plant with roots. And by the way, if you're pulling, if you're seeking cuttings and you get a little cutting like this with roots already, we've well, got a plant. So you're you're 100 there if you have roots. And uh, just be careful not to overwater them. I usually water my pots here in Half Moon Bay once a week, and then I let them dry out completely before I water them again. In the winter time, they can get overly wet, so you be careful not to up pot too soon to the next pot size. And if you do have to up pot, go for the next smallest and the next largest, not the giant size pot. Don't give it a lot of soil to sit in to, for too long, because in the winter we can have days of multiple rain and you wanna make sure that they have a chance to dry out. You can even use a moisture meter like this to help determine whether or not to water. Make sure it says zero or dry bef before you water again. And then when you water, make sure it says wet and then just wait until it dries out again. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, new share. Let's go to Oh, let me go back to close that. Darn it, sorry. I gotta close that screen. Okay. Uh, sorry. We don't want to hear about prostate, so. <laughs> Okay, where am I now? We want to go to um, Zoom meeting. I don't want to close the Zoom, Zoom meeting. Let me close this. Okay, back here. Sorry, got to get back to my Zoom view gallery. Can you hear me, Cam? No. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you can. Okay. Yeah. I just. Yeah, I just need to exit this area and get back to the screen. Sorry. All good. All good. So screen sharing. All I'm seeing is all the participants right now. So I need to get back to speaker view. Oh, there we go. And share screen again. Or. Can people see me? Um, either way, if you're just concluding, um, just yeah. one yeah. last question, or you can put your conclusion slides. I, I don't know if you have more slides. Yeah, I, I do, but I just need to oh, share a screen. Here we go. I get so frazzled. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're fine. 
When I'm under pressure, I get so fragile. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I'm back to beginning here, but I need to, from current slide, share slideshow. I don't know. I can just zip through the slides again because I'm actually... I need to be I need to be more in tune with all of this. Okay, so I do have some in, some reference slides that people can refer to my sources right over here and you're not seeing are you seeing um yes, yeah, so you can just, just do the full screen there. Yeah. So not from the from, from current, current slide. slide. Yeah. There we go. Hallelujah. Thank you. Okay. So references. Here's my references that you can refer to when you get the slide deck emailed to you. And I want to thank Lingso Garden Materials for hosting us, even though it's not listed as acknowledgement. Thank you very much for providing this forum for us. Um, and then I think that is, and then I, I thought I had a slide with our hours but it's not in this deck because we stopped having hours during COVID. So that's why it's not in this deck, but I'll try to add it in and then people will know where they can go and, and seek out advice from Master Gardeners in person. Okay. All righty. Thanks, Janice. So a couple okay. more questions uh, for you here. Um, uh, succulent soil, um, would you say three parts potting soil plus one part pumice um what's a general potting soil recipe or what do you suggest? yeah okay well for cuttings i would probably do one part pumice to three parts potting mix um but in general for most succulents i do one part pumice or you can use perlite it's not as sustainable but i use one part pumice to four parts of a good quality potting mix that contains some quar fiber i like the quar coconut fiber that tends to retain moisture just right, not too dry, not too moist. And I also want to make a correction when I when I told people when to water the plant with a moisture meter. Now I tell people because Deborah Lee Baldwin made this correction on in her on her advice is that when it approaches dryness is the best time to water when it's at with the moisture meter at six inches in depth. It's when it's approaching dryness, but not completely dry. That's the ideal time to water your succulents again. Or finger depth dryness, uh, total dryness at finger depth. That's fine too. But you don't want the roots to completely dry out because if they do, then you, they have to regenerate and that takes a lot of time. And when I did the video and I pointed out, you know, oh, here's a cutting that has a root. Well, that's a plant. That's only a plant if you put those roots in, in moist soil right away. Because if the roots dry out, then it has to regenerate roots. So I just wanted to make that correction. All righty. Okay. Um, so here's the last uh, question. Um, it's more of a recommendation, but um, this person has, uh, they have a south facing area, which gets awful lot of sun, um, gets really hot during summertime. Do you have specific recommendation for south facing uh, gardens? If it's, not in San Mateo or San Francisco County, is and she's out because we don't know where everyone is coming from. And they could be in the valley or Florida. Once we had participants from Florida, right? That's really hot, but too wet for most succulents. But south facing in the Bay Area, um, you can grow most any of these plants that I that I showed you. I mean, there there was some redwood. I've gr grown aeoniums on the south facing side and. Emerald Hills and Redwood City, and that's pretty warm. Um, agaves can take the heat more better than most plants. So those are always a good choice if you really want some heat, heat tolerant ones. Uh, any of those heat tolerant ones that I showed in the slides, any of those would be good, good choices. But if you live in the Bay Area, you can probably grow just about any of those plants that I had in my slides on the All south right. side. Okay. Thank you. One uh, one last question here. What's the best way to propagate Ionium sunburst, uh, leaves or stems? 
it's it I've never been able to propagate a sunburst from leaves because they're not juicy enough they don't hold enough water the stem holds a lot more water and you're going to be more successful propagating a sunburst with the stem okay okay awesome any closing uh, uh, comments that you want to share with the audience today um, well, just go out there and have fun while the weather is looking good and there's no rain in the forecast, right? Get out there. <laughs> Get dirty. Get your hands dirty. Okay. All right. All right, Janice. Well, thank you everybody for attending and thank you very much, Janice, for this wonderful class. And then we'll get the slides emailed out to the participants uh, by tomorrow. And the class is recorded and will be available on YouTube as well as Linksos Community Garden, or excuse me, Community <laughs> Resources page. Okay. Um, thanks everybody. Thanks, Janice. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.